Good morning, everybody. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so thankful to have you here today. Uh, and I hope that this morning is something that builds you up and encourages you. Oh, we have a light here. It's good. Good for my old eyes. Uh, we really hope that this morning is really beneficial to you. Um, if you're a member here, we're equally pleased that you're here. Um, like Damien said, it's really good for each of us to see each other, to be together, to be able to encourage each other and strengthen each other. So we're really thankful that each of you are here today. Um, I have to say to you, I am both excited and not excited about this lesson this morning. Um, I'll go with not excited first. Uh, the reason I am not excited is this lesson is a lesson that's answering a question that somebody in the some people in the congregation asked to do with us choosing new leadership. And so I wanted to take this lesson really seriously and I wrote it and then sent it to the elders so they could look through it so that we were all in agreement about it and everything. So that means that I can't really go off script. And you guys know me that I tend to get excited and then I go off script. So I'm trying to intentionally not be excited. So if I start getting too worked up, if I start moving around too much away from here, you just need to point back to the podium and I'll try to settle down and refocus. Um, the reason I am excited is because like I said, this is a talk. This is another step on the journey that we are making to adding to the leadership group of our church. And that is very exciting. That there are people in this congregation who have put their hands up and said, I want to take this on because there's no getting around the fact that being a shepherd or a deacon is a challenge. And it's largely a thankless task. Like I, I do see pe people from time to time going up to the shepherds or going up to the deacons and saying, I really appreciate everything you do for this group. That's wonderful. Um, but the reality is a lot of stuff that they do, nobody sees it. And so it's a challenging thing. And so for people to put their hands up and say, I'm willing to help is wonderful and exciting. Um, so if you remember, this was a while ago, it was probably about seven or eight weeks ago, um, Paul put out some surveys. And one of the things on the survey about our leadership was, do you have any questions that you would like us to study further? And one question that came up a couple of times was, what do we do with what's taught in Timothy and Titus around the concept of believing children? Um, the idea that do, do the children of a shepherd, is, does the Bible require them to be Christians? And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going we're gonna to talk about that idea. Um, as I said, the elders have had a look at the message that I'm going to share with you. Um, so they are in agreement with it. Um, if they, if they, anything that I said that they didn't agree with, they've already looked at that. Um, and after the worship, because we don't have class today, so after the worship service is over, I think um, a few of the elders are going to be up here in this front corner, and if you want to have a discussion with them about anything we've talked about today, then you'll have the opportunity to do that, because I think it's good for us to have feedback with each other about these kind of topics. Um, so to begin with, I just want to say clearly from the beginning that it is my belief and it is the belief of our shepherds that the Bible does not require children to be Christians for a man to serve as shepherd. And obviously the rest of the sermon is going to be giving you reasons for that. But I understand that maybe there are some people in the congregation who don't agree with that view. And I guess what I would encourage you to do is to hear me out this morning as I talk through this and have a read through the passages that we read together. And then I promise you, because the shepherds have already said that they'll do this, but also for myself as well, that if you want to come talk to me or the shepherds about what you believe, I'll hear you out as well. Um, but I think it's really important for us to hear each other, because sometimes as soon as we hear that somebody doesn't agree with me, I just stop listening to anything that they say. So I hope you can stay with, stay with us this morning for a few minutes. So before we get to Timothy and Titus, I want us to think about the idea, the basis of the idea from the viewpoint of if we say the Bible does require that an elder's children needs to be Christians, what is the foundation of that idea? And I believe that the foundation of that idea is pretty shaky because the basis of that thinking is that one person is responsible for another person's choice about following Jesus or not. We're essentially saying that the shepherd is responsible. He, he is able to make the choice for his children or able to force his children to make the choice to follow Jesus. But when we look in the scripture, that's not how the Bible views it. The Bible is very, very clear that each person 
makes their own choice. So for myself as a father, it is partially my responsibility to teach my children about Jesus, to teach them about the Bible, to teach them about what I believe is important and things about spiritual matters. But it is not my responsibility for their choice because I don't have any control over their choice. They choose whether they're going to serve Jesus or not when they reach the appropriate age, right? So let's look at a couple of passages that have to do with that. The first one we're going to look at is Romans chapter 2. Um, funnily enough, uh, Wayne, a couple of weeks ago, looked at this passage uh, in the lesson that he gave in talking about how we'll all one day face judgment. So in Romans chapter, chapter 2, and starting in verse 6, Paul says, God will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But the, to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, whether Jew or also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. So Paul is really clear here in his writings that each person stands on their own choices. It is the choices that each one of us make that will be telling in the day of judgment. Now, if that is concerning to you because you've made some bad choices in your life, which I'm on that list, um, you have to hang around to the end of the lesson where we're going to talk a little bit more about what Paul continues to say in Romans. But just let me say now that there is some good news about that as well. But Paul is really clear here that we each stand based on our own choices, right? Another passage that I want us to look at quickly is in 2 Corinthians 5. So at the end of a discussion about us looking forward to the day where we'll be with God forever, eternally, he ends that discussion in verse 10 of, of 2 Corinthians 5 by saying, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So again, I am, I am not going to be called before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for Jared. And he's not going to be called before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for me or for you. We each stand before God based on our own choices and our own decisions. The last passage that I want us to look at in this regard is in Ezekiel 18. So I would really encourage you, if you have time later this week, and this is a subject that interests you, if it's not, I can understand that. Um, but if it's a subject that interests you, to read the whole of Ezekiel 18. Um, the entire chapter is dwelling on this idea of, is there a shared accountability? Or does each per is each person accountable to God for themselves? But I'm just going to pick out just a small piece of this passage for us to look at. So this is Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Verse, yes, verse 20. I can read. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity or the sin of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. So God can't be any more plain in, than saying it like that, that each person stands or falls based on their own choices. So I think that that's a really important point for us to think about before we even get to Timothy and Titus, to look at this word that sometimes we get a little bit tangled up in, right? We're not going to read the Timothy passage. For one thing, Timothy says it, I think, a little bit more clearly, so I don't think it's as, de as debated as what Titus says. And also, Dennis already read the Timothy passage for us, so it's pretty fresh in your mind. But I do want us to read Titus chapter 1 and verse 6, because this is often the passage that people who believe that uh, an elder's children need to be Christians, this is the passage that they point to. So let's, let's read that together. I'm going to read Titus chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, 
For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Now I read from the English Standard Version. So the English Standard Version there in verse six says, and his children are believers. And so that's what gets people, right? Is that it says right there that they're supposed to be believers. So that means that they have to be believers in Jesus. That means that they have to be baptized Christians. It's not as easy as that. <laughs> because the funny thing is, if you read through the ESV, you can't do that up here, but if you have an ESV on your phone or something like that, it'll have a footnote next to that word believer. And at the bottom, it says, or could mean faithful. And if you have an NIV, which is the other like main translation that English readers use today, the English, the, the NIV says, and his children are faithful. And it has a footnote and you go to the bottom and it says, or could mean believers. So the two main English translations both agree that this word is a problem. It's hard to know exactly what this means. And I, and I wanna be clear about that because there are lots of things in the Bible that aren't crystal clear. We can't just say, well, that's just the way it is and we don't have to think about it anymore, right? There's lots of things in the Bible like that. And so when we're in that situation, we have to be really generous towards each other and really gentle towards each other. It does, I'm not saying we should avoid those. Obviously today we're discussing one of those very issues, but we have to think about our attitude towards each other as we do it. If you disagree with what I believe, I'm okay with that. I, I'm not gonna try to kick you out of the church and I certainly hope you don't try to kick me out of the church. I think we can find a way forward together. But this is, a, this is a difficult passage to understand. So I'm not a Greek scholar, but here we go. That word there that the ESV translate as believers and the NIV translate as faithful, that word in the Greek is pistos. Now, not a Greek scholar, but that word is super common in the New Testament. It is used a lot. And I'm not even gonna come close to us looking at all of the usages of it. But I want you to see that part of the way we figure out what this word means is the context of what's written in the moment. Because this word is used in a variety of different ways that are sort of within sort of an idea, but you know, it's a couple of different ways. So the first thing that I want us to think about when we look at elsewhere in the scripture is it's always good to stay close. So Timothy and Titus were both written by the same guy. They were written by Paul. So it'd be good for us to think about how else does Paul use this word? Well, the funny thing is in 1 Timothy 3, we don't have to go very far because the very opening of what he says in 1 Timothy 3, 1 is he starts the discussion of elders by saying, this is a trustworthy saying, or the ESV says, this saying is trustworthy. Our word's in there. You know where it is? Trustworthy. It's the same word. It's pistos. Same word in Greek. So here, it's not like this word believes in Jesus, although pistos is used that way some. It's that this is a trustworthy, a faithful saying, a saying that we can hold on to, right? If we go to 1 Corinthians 1, 9, Paul says something that is said many, many times in the Bible, where he says, God is faithful. And there's our word again, faithful, pistos. Again, it's not God believes in himself. It's that he is someone to be trusted. He is somebody that is going to do what he says. He's faithful, right? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, Paul is talking about the stewardship that he and Apollos have to all of, all of the Christians that they work with, that it's important that they work with integrity. And he bases that in 1 Corinthians 4, 2 on an axiom that he assumes everybody understands where he says, a servant is required to be found faithful. So obviously, if you are having people working for you, you need them to be faithful. You need them to be trustworthy. And so if he is going to work for God and Apollos is going to work for God, they need to be trustworthy. One more. In Matthew 25, the really famous um, parable of Jesus where he talks about a master who is leaving on a journey and he leaves three servants in charge of various things that he's doing and he gives them some money. And he says, I want you to take this money and make me some more money. Right? You guys remember this story? 
And when he comes back, the first servant says, hey, you gave me this much money and I made you double. And the second servant says, hey, you gave me this much money, I made you double. And you remember the third servant is like, I was basically terrified of you and didn't know what to do. So I just hid your money in the ground and here you go, here's your money back. If you remember what he, what the master says to the first two servants is this, he says, well done, good and faithful. There's our word, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will now set you over much. I'll now, I'll now put you in charge of more important things. But here Jesus uses that word pistos twice, where he says, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little. So again, what is Jesus getting at here? Is he talking about a person? Is he saying these servants have shown a lot of faith in Jesus? No, he said they have been trustworthy over what they've been given. The master trusted them and they proved that they deserved his trust. And so now he's rewarding them for that, right? So then when we go back to Titus, the question is, what does that word mean here? If, any, if anyone, any potential shepherd is above reproach, the husband of one, of one wife, and his children are pistos, and not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination, this is important. In verse 7, he says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. The question is, does that word pistos here, does it fit to say it must mean believers in Jesus? Or does it fit to say that they must be trustworthy? They must be faithful. Well, my argument is that it, it's the same, which is basically not respecting people that have authority over them. And why is that important? He says in verse 7, that's important because the shepherd is going to be God's steward. And so he has to be able to prove that he's able to manage his family well, right? So this is the crux of the issue. I'm almost certain that there are probably some people in the audience that are listening to what I'm saying and saying, I don't agree with that. It says believers, it means believers. I've given you my reasons why I think it means faithful or trustworthy. And each of us have to think about what we believe about that, right? two things are really, really important. Again, I want to make it really, really clear that one of the things this passage is definitely saying is that a man who is putting his name forward to be a shepherd needs to be a good father who has managed his household well, that has a healthy, good relationship with his children. Certainly the idea is there that they have taught their children about who Jesus is and what the Bible says about judgment and about other things, all of that is here in that passage. I am not disagreeing with that. Um, I hope that even if you're sort of saying this question doesn't really matter to me very much, I hope that you sort of get that it's still valuable for us to think about why we believe what we believe and how we use the Bible to come to a determination of what we believe or what we're going to do on a given issue. That's a really valuable thing to do. But I want to get back to the point that we made early on, like in Romans 2, where Paul talks about that each of us are going to have to stand before God. And everything is going to be laid bare. Our good choices and our bad choices are going to be there for God to judge. I, does, is anybody else totally terrified when they read that passage in Romans 2? I, I, I honestly think you should be. Like, I think that's the goal of that passage. And really, Paul is building to a greater point that he gets to in the middle of Romans 3, where he says it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, every person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every person deserves to be separated from God forever. So the inverse of that is true. No person deserves to be in internal relationship with God. That's the point that he's making in Romans 2. But that's not the end of the story. That's just Romans 2. And Romans goes on for like another 16, well, not another 16 chapters, but it's 16 chapters overall. So there's more to the story. Romans 3, he says, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what? None of us deserve, none of us can earn salvation. So what did God decide to do? He gifted salvation to humanity. He freely gave us salvation through Jesus Christ. And later in Romans 7, Paul is going to continue to talk about this trap 
that each of us find ourselves in, right? That we know about good things to do, but we don't always do them. Anybody here like that? Anybody here just even this week think, oh, I should really do this for so-and-so, and and then you didn't do it? (laughs) He says, that's part of the trap. The other part of the trap is, I know what God doesn't want me to do. And even more than that, not only do I know he doesn't want me to do it, I agree with him that it's not good for me to do it. But what? But those are the things I find myself doing. I know, I don't need Dennis Vandercrats to tell me that I should spend more time exercising and less time watching TV, right? I don't need a health expert. I don't need a personal trainer to tell me that. I know that. What do I find myself doing at the end of the day? Watching TV, right? Paul says, I agree with God that some things are bad for me and I shouldn't do them, but I find myself doing them anyway. So how does he end that passage? He says, I'm, I'm a wretched person who is doomed because I can't do what God wants me to do and I can't stop doing the things he doesn't want me to do. And so you, you get that feeling of hopelessness again like you get in Romans 2. But what does he say at the end of Romans 7? He says, but thanks be to God that through the glorious name of his son, I am saved. And so he begins Roman chapter 8 with one of the most beautiful sentences in the Bible. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. If you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, the bad news is you will face judgment. Not just you, all of humanity. We all will stand before God and be judged. But the good news is you can be free from condemnation. You can be forgiveness. You can have forgiveness. You can be given atonement for your sins through the blood of Jesus. It's what we celebrated earlier around the table with Damien. And from there, you can begin to bring what Jesus brought into the world. You can begin to be a part of that, where you are bringing healing and hope and forgiveness and strength into the world as you spend time with other people in your community, right? So if you're not a Christian today, I really want you to think about that part of it. If you're a member of our congregation today, that's what we are all supposed to be, right? We are supposed to be these people who are celebrating our own forgiveness while we reach out to other people and tell them the good news about Jesus. And part of what needs to happen in our congregation is that we need godly leaders to lead us. And that's why we had the conversation we had this morning. Again, we're going to have another song right after I get down. And then Paul is going to give us some announcements and things like that. And then if you want to talk to the shepherds about what we've talked about this morning, then there'll be the opportunity to do that. If you don't want to do that or you just need to take your kids in the other room or whatever, you can do that too. But uh, the opportunity will be there either way. Thanks, everyone.